So today is the day before <clears throat> the, uh, or the day of the tram party, so I can talk loudly and it's okay. And you should be awake, it's a decent time in the morning. Uh, what I'd like to talk about this morning is the programmer. Now I'm gonna, obviously that connects to a lot of things. I wanna talk about the role, not from a boring organizational point of view, but from the point of view of what motivates people what about skills? Let's look a little bit further than what people normally think of as being the programmer. So I want to mix the technical side and art, and craft, and a number of other things. So there is this idea, the programmer, so generously enough, my parents gave me an internet unique name, so you can um, uh, stalk me on Twitter there. But let's look at this word, programmer. Because in some cases, people have favoured using the word developer. And I use the word developer. And the like, programmer is somehow not good enough. But actually, I think it's a great word. Because it tells you pretty much what you're doing. Because developer, I've met lots of developers who can't program. It's a skill. Programming is a skill. And developer is a better word. I don't think that's a better word always. It's a common word, but it's not a better word because there's other meanings. If you talk to some people and you say, you know, you're a developer, what does that mean? Real estate developer. That's really not very exciting. You don't want to be associated with those people. So what, what does this thing mean? Um, one who writes computer programs. And you might say, well, I do more than write computer programs. I, I, I create all kinds of stuff. Well. Yeah, I'm going to talk about writing. A person who prepares and tests programs for devices. Ooh, now that's interesting. I open this talk with the word test, and I mean to continue. Testing is part of programming. It's not a separate thing. It turns out that programming touches many things. It touches the device. It touches the consumers, the customers. It touches the tests, and obviously there's code. And obviously, there's the standard definition, an organism capable of turning caffeine into code. This is, this is the pipeline that we're familiar with. Okay. I, have met, I have met developers who don't drink coffee. They are a strange breed. So we've got this idea of a, a formal idea of a, a programmer. So let's understand the role of the programmer in the development process. So, if you, don't, if you don't follow or look at commit strip, now is your opportunity. It's, it's great. It's a well done cartoon, that four frame cartoon, um, uh, that really there's some great stuff in there. So you've got, the, uh, you've got the UI designer just making the observation to the programmer. He says, uh, someday we won't even need coders anymore. We'll be able to just write the specifications and the program will write itself. Okay, people have been tr talking about this since, I don't know, 1960s. Good luck with that. We're still going. Oh, wow, you're right. We'll, have the, uh, we'll be able to write a comprehensive and precise spec, and bam, we won't need programmers anymore. Exactly. And do you know the industry term for a project specification that is comprehensive and precise enough to generate a program? Uh, no. Code. It's called code. That is, what, that is what a specification is. Your code is your product design. It's not, design is not somehow separate. Your code is a very detailed specification of what you would like. It is unambiguous, which is sometimes why it's surprising. But it is precise. There's no hand waving, not like a written spec, not like somebody writing on a card saying, I kind of want something that does this. It's really precise. Sometimes you say, well, it's like the machine. You're programming the machine. You are not programming the machine. This is sometimes why it's useful to understand what's actually going on. If you think, so if you're developing a mobile app, what are you actually developing it on? Let's say that you are targeting a mobile phone. Are you developing your code on the mobile? No, you're developing it on a PC of some kind and you're running a simulation. And below that simulation, there's actually an operating system that's doing the real thing. That itself might be virtualized. 
And then somewhere down here, there's machine instructions. Oh, but we haven't hit the hardware yet, because those machine instructions are a fiction. They're just made up. You've got to go deeper in, and you'll find the firmware is doing something completely different. And there's all this kind of crazy stuff, L1, L2, L3 caching. There's multi-core, there's pipeline, there's instruction resequencing. None of this is visible in the programming language that you are using. You are so far removed from the machine that actually it makes something like C look like Haskell from the point of view of the machine. They are almost identical languages from the perspective of the machine. You are writing a high-level specification, which is why it's hard. So this is the point. I made this observation. Oh, I realized actually it's a really long time ago, last century. And uh, it kind of got a bit of a meme thing going a few years ago. And uh, Sebastian Hamida uh, made this lovely graphic. Typing is not the bottleneck. In software development, it's not an act of typing. That's not the challenge. Hey, we need to get people to type more. That's been the target that people have been trying to hit. In many, every now and then, people try to do this since the 1960s. Oh, typing. We need to get, you know, we need to generate code because typing is clearly the problem that people have. No, 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 it's thinking, it's reasoning, it's logic. And so there is this idea. I, I uh, edited this book a few years back, 97 Things Every Programmer Should Know. And in the preface, I made an observation. I said, there is an art, craft, and science to programming that extends far beyond the program. The act of programming marries the discrete world of computers with the fluid world of human affairs. That's the thing that's tricky. The whole thing is that a computer of any kind, whether a device or something distributed, is many things. It represents something very concrete, but it also represents something potentially abstract. And I willfully use the term programmer there in the title and in the preface. Programmers mediate between the negotiated and uncertain truths of business and the crisp, uncompromising domain of bits and bytes and higher constructed types. This is the challenge. The challenge is not just to do with the, with the kind of the core stuff of code. The challenge is the fact that you've got this really sloppy stuff over here, what sometimes we delightfully call the people thing. And it turns out that people are kind of messy. And code is really kind of, you know, it does the right thing, except when it doesn't, but there's always a reason. We're not entirely sure what it is that people do. And we like to think of ourselves as being logical. And when I say ourselves, I'm talking about people in software development because they think, well, I'm logical, I'm rational, because I deal with logic every day. And you think, yeah, I'm special. Well, maybe you are special. But actually, you're not that logical. This guy here, if, you, if you're working in a programming language that has a Boolean data type, Here's the man, Bull, George Bull himself. Middle of the 19th century, in the height of the Industrial Revolution, and science was, science was covering everything. Everybody thought we would know the universe by the end of the century. We would understand how it all fitted together. And George Bull was there, and he said he rationalized and formalized propositional calculus, what we call now Boo Boolean algebra, and he formalized it, but look at the book title, apart from the fact that it's really long. People these days talk about it as being just the laws of thought. But the, the proper Victorian title, An Investigation of the Laws of Thought on Which Are Founded the Mathematical Theories of Logic and Probabilities. Whew. It's like a, it's, it's like a, it's, it's like a click, but it's kind of like a clickbait title, but without the clickbait. Okay, it's ridiculously long. But notice there's a, an assumption there. It's absolutely fascinating. It's this classic idea that actually we are rational creatures and somehow society messes up our thinking. In the Victorian age, there was the idea that we are actually deeply logical creatures. Modern science tells a different story. Gary Marcus's book, Kluge, captures this rather nicely. He says, you know, are human beings noble in reason, infinite in faculty? as William Shakespeare wrote. Perfect in God's image, as some biblical scholars have asserted. Hardly. The whole book describes the mess that is our mind and our shortcuts of thinking. It turns out that software people are people. 
and therefore they're subject to all the same messy stuff as other human beings. We're actually not very logical. We just like to think we are. Which means that when it comes to talking about the nature of our work, we end up covering many different disciplines, because it's not one discipline. In the introduction, the book I co-authored a few years ago on patterns, pattern-oriented software architecture, um, uh, Wayne Cool makes this observation about all these different disciplines that we touch and talk about. Art, craft, engineering, science. These are the swirling muses of design patterns. Art and science are stories. Craft and engineering are actions. It's a really interesting way of looking at it. But if we're going to talk about art, Sometimes people take that a little bit too far. It, there's a perspective from Paul Graham, um, kind of lisp guy. He says, hacking and painting have a lot in common. In fact, of all the different types of people I've known, hackers and painters are among the, uh, uh, among the most alike. I'm just going to say he needs to get out more. Because really, I mean, I kind of understand the appeal to the arts, but quite frankly, Paintings have surprise, as I don't, I don't paint, but I'm going to say I do occasionally draw, and I'm going to say it's really different compared with some other things that I do. Really different. But then he acknowledges there is a difference. What hackers and painters have in common is they're both makers. Well, woo, there's lots of people who are makers. You can't just say, hey, look, these two things are makers, therefore they're the same. Let's look at some of these other people, along with composers, architects, and writers. You know what? Composers, architects, and writers have more in common with people who program than painters. Because if, you if you're a musician, you're actually dealing with abstract information structures. You are also dealing with aesthetics simultaneously. You are dealing with a, a more fluid and constant form of revision. The revision with painting, when you change a painting, there's a physical pushback. We don't get that in software. Music is much more of the mind. When we deal with architects, there are many metaphors, which I don't propose to cover here, and writers, which I'll come back to. And there's this idea of making good things. And sometimes people, perhaps people make analogies because sometimes they don't fully understand what's really going on. So this famous Van Gogh picture, Starry Night. Don Wells, a few years ago, uh, one of the original extreme programming guys, made the observation, agile models are paintings, not photographs. And what he's trying to say there is that they're not exact. But that's, that's a misunderstanding of paintings. You see, although this looks very abstracted, it turns out that you can actually tell what night this was and where in France this was, because it turns out that Van Gogh actually chose the stars in the exact positions. This is a very faithful rendering of reality. It is better than a photograph. If you're going to say, if you want to make an art analogy, agile models are not paintings. If anything, they are sketches. So let's be very careful when we draw analogies from other disciplines. Let's find something that's a little more similar. One of the things that I do, and I don't just deal with people who do software development. I'm an independent consultant and trainer. But sometimes I like to, I don't know, take pictures of books. That's a hobby. Okay, I've got quite good at it, I think. They're much easier than people. Yeah, much easier. Um, but I write short fiction, really short fiction. It's uh, one of the anthologies I've uh, had my work included in. And I've found there's some really interesting differences, and there are some interesting commonalities. I'm as excited and interested in the differences as by the commonalities. One of the things that we find that is obviously different is that writers, sometimes people joke about, you know, writers are, uh, or software developers, uh, people in software development, sometimes a little bit introverted, you know, programmer types. They're kind of like, yeah, you know, we don't really socialize. Well, here you all are socializing. Tram party. It turns out, if you think that programmers are introverted, you really need to go and speak to some writers. They, 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 they do make everybody, they make all programmers look like tram party animals. <laughs> they really, because they work alone. If you think about how software development is done, if you think about all, when people are talking about best practices, and when they talk about communication, we spend a lot of time talking about, well, 
how do we communicate? There's a customer, there's members of the team, there's different roles within a team, there's different skills. What about coding practices? What about the guidelines? All of these are discussions about how to get lots of people to work together. Writers don't generally work like that. Writers are often, well, they work alone. It's not that people don't co-author things, it's just unusual. So it turns out that they're very isolated. That's clearly an obvious difference. But on the other hand, they deal with information structures, they deal with composition, and they care about how the composition comes out. That much they do have in common. So, there's another observation I think is worth making. And actually, you get a slight feeling of it from the cover of that. One of the other differences is, um, it was noted, there's a number of women here, well done. You're actually beating the industry average. But, if, but a very interesting experience is to go to the writing community. When I go to the writing community, I'm in a minority because I'm male. Okay? It's really interesting experience. Okay? If you are a male, if you're a woman, you're going, yeah, big deal. I know that already. So it's a really interesting, there's, that's one of the differences. But I want to focus now on some of the commonalities. I also want to um, be aware of this idea when we talk about craft, crafting the code. And there's an interesting thing in writing. They don't just talk about the they they talk about the craft of writing. But you know the funny thing is they don't talk about the craft of writing. We ha we talk about software craftsmanship and the craft of writing code. They don't talk about the craft of writing. Do you know what they talk about? They talk about the craft. They don't even use the word writing. It's one of the only disciplines I've ever seen people actually use the term craft, just the craft, and everybody knows what you mean. People say, oh, you're learning the craft. There's no question of the craft of what. These guys have a really strong claim to this. So, obviously we need to mind the gap between any metaphor or alternative parallel that we use, but we can shed a lot of light on what we want in software. So I'm going to sort of take you back in time, uh, a couple of thousand years back in time. The Roman architect Vitruvius stated there are three properties of a building architecture that make it good. He said there are three things that we want from a building architecture. Firmitas, the Latin for strength or robustness or firmness. This is what we want in software as well. You want something to be robust. Yeah. Not entirely sure how useful this application is. You see, I, I like taking photographs and screenshots of software failures. It has now got to the point that I no longer need to do this. People send me this stuff. Okay, I have about seven or 800 photos. People just say, they send me stuff on Twitter, they send me stuff via email. You know, somebody might have wanted to test that. They might have wanted to test this as well. I got sent this one. I love this one. You see, there's a, there's a sort of a, an element here where what you have is there's a, a loss of encapsulation. We spend our time talking about, oh, I need to encapsulate this. I need to, I need to abstract this. I need to decouple my dependencies. And then you drop the thing on the floor and it breaks along the lines, the faults that it already had. When a piece of software breaks, it loses its encapsulation. Here we go, PHP. And there's the object model. I can see it. Oops. And then there's this idea. This, none of this is new. This is John Bentley's work. It's classic stuff. John Bentley's work. Um, in there, he, there's a wonderful observation. Uh, there's a collection of quotes. And this is still relatively true, although we feel the numbers might have changed. It takes three times the effort to find and fix bugs in system tests than when done by the developer. It takes ten times the effort to find and fix bugs in the field than when done in system tests. Therefore, insist on unit tests by the developer. Some people think, oh, this is a new idea that developers should test their own code. Yeah, it's new, like, you know, last century. It's new, like, before the Berlin Wall came down. That's how new it is. But he also, there's another observation here that I think is really important. When people talk about architecture, they always think, oh, you leave out the details. No. 
There's a point here, details count. And in software, this is important. You should never, you know, always be suspicious if you ever find yourself or somebody else saying, oh, don't worry about that, it's a detail. People do this all the time. What they're doing is, oh, it's not important, it's just a detail, it's just a small detail. Don't worry about it, it's only a detail. It has no deep significance. That, what do you think software is? What do you think the job of a programmer is? Only details. That is all software is. It's lots of details combined together to create a thing. And somebody has to respect those and do those. It doesn't just happen because you wave your hand. I mean, that'd be a really cool, you know, really cool wizard. You know, it's just like, yeah, do what I mean. Whoop, suddenly, there it is. It doesn't work like that. You have, somebody has to do the details. And it turns out sometimes the details do count. I offer you left pad. This is the code that brought down an awful lot of websites earlier this year. Apparently, lots of people decided they had no idea. Remember I said that there's lots of people out there who are developers but not programmers. They need to pad a string. So they introduce an external dependency. I mean, if you're, you know, it's one thing, if you are a shepherd, you want lots of sheep. If you are a programmer, you do not want lots of dependencies. It's not your job to herd dependencies. Yeah? You don't get a bigger flock. That doesn't give you any extra rewards. And for various reasons of intellectual property and exactly what the author of this code was entitled to do, withdrew this code. And suddenly, websites everywhere failed. You see, and the problem is, it's not exactly hard code. It's not even good code. And it's got a bug. You see, I don't, I'm not a JavaScript developer. That's, that's not one of the things I do. I, I, I feel that if there's enough distance between me and JavaScript, I'm happy. But I thought, let's have a look at this code. And I found a bug. It doesn't actually quite do what it's supposed to. If you put in a fill string that's longer than one character, it fails. It's like, that's a really trivial case. Test the damn thing. So we have a couple of things here. So I thought I'd have a go at rewriting it so that it was correct and direct and didn't have so much state going around. And yeah, it's embarrassingly small. And by the way, if you use a proper programming language, not JavaScript, you, can, you don't even write this. You know, this is one expression in, in Python. Yeah? But in JavaScript, it's just like, oh, well, you know, we're <laughs> it's like banging rocks together. Yeah? And it's just like, is this a good, I don't know. Oh, we've got a rock framework. Oh, is that? OK, let's create, create more frameworks. Oh, honestly, people, come on. These are solvable problems. So I thought I'd do crazy stuff. And so this actually works and is shorter and more direct. So th there's an interesting point here. I don't know if you've seen this, the a really joke series. Taking on needless dependencies, fragile development guide. Yeah. Code written by some stranger on the internet is always perfect. This is the belief. You don't know where it's been. We tell our children not to talk to strangers. Why is the advice any different? Okay, there's a balance here. We want to reuse people's intellectual effort because programmers are smart. On the other hand, programmers are also human. There's a counterbalance there. We can't use everything. So, robustness, utilitas. That's the second of Vitruvius's properties. Utilitas, what does that mean? Utilitas means utility. It means useful. It means that what we create should be useful. It should not just be robust. Somebody should actually want to use it. It should fulfill a need, either a need that people didn't know they had or a need that they've already told you. This would make a difference to our business. This is where the conversation comes in. This is where the kind of discussion about requirements. In other words, software is built to fulfill a purpose. That's a primary thing. It is utilitarian. Now, I've always got a joke about the java.util package. In fact, it's about any util package anywhere. If you have a project and you have a package or a module or a subsystem or a library that is called util, utils, utilities, you have no idea what you're doing. Because all code should be useful. Yeah, why is this a utility and that's not? You know, if a piece of code is not useful, then you should put it in java.art. You go, oh, that's beautiful, but not useful. <laughs> All code should be in utils. That's what it's for. It's a failure of naming. It's a failure of classification. We say, oh, yeah, but collections, they're useful. Yeah, and so is I.O. 
and talking to the web, and uh, all of this stuff is useful. Why aren't they all in utils? Yeah? It's, it, we're not saying anything useful. But let's go deeper. It turns out that sometimes we can get, we, there's some absolutely brilliant examples or counterexamples of crazy code out there that really, one, does not fulfill a useful purpose, but also makes something unnecessarily complex. I mean, we come across this. Uh, th this guy creates on, on YouTube, um, the, uh, to get it, the TSA, the US um, kind of immigrant, well, security border control, they wanted an app. The actual app cost about 50,000 US dollars to develop and about 300,000 US dollars to deploy. It was deployed, um, uh, it was developed in, uh, under iOS, it was deployed on iPads. Um, and he redeveloped it on YouTube in Android in 10 minutes. I'm sure he could have done it in iOS. This is not an iOS versus Android thing. This is simply, he was able on a YouTube video, and he didn't even do it directly. I think if he'd rehearsed it, it would have taken him about five minutes. But he kind of discusses things on the way, and he makes a couple of mistakes. He's kind of laid back about it, and it takes him 10 minutes. That's a, you know, I want this job. Because clearly somebody had a, something really good. Because this is the whole thing. What was the purpose? They'd stand there with the tablet. And it's to randomize which queue you go in at the airport. And it has an arrow that points that way and an arrow that points that way. And then they use a profound decision-making device, like one of these, but internalized, that flips basically a random number as to whether you should go left or right. That apparently cost you know, a third of a million US dollars to develop and deploy. And there's a human being standing there pressing this. This is a total waste of a human being. This is not useful, and this is just shockingly bad code. But if you happen to be the development company on the other end of it, you are sitting in the pub laughing. Okay? So, what else do we want? What else do we want? We want Venustas. What the hell's Venustas? Well, it's better understood if you drop the last three letters. You get Venus, the goddess of beauty, the Roman goddess of beauty. It should be beautiful. Well, beauty in software, mm, that's a difficult thing. You definitely can't discuss that sober. But perhaps we're, what we're trying to appeal to here is there is an element for art. There is an element for aesthetics. It may not be the primary driver, but it has an important part to play. We consider the user experience. There should be something aesthetic about that. It should not merely be functional there, but there should be something about it that draws us to it. But I also want to consider the other side of it. I've, this, this talk is called The Programmer. I want to consider the programmer experience. The programmer is a user, a user of the code, a user of their tools, a user of their development process and practices. What do they want from it? What's that experience like? What does your code base feel like on a day-to-day -day basis? Is it a comfortable experience? And this concept was captured rather nicely by uh, Dick Gabriel a number of years ago in a book called Patterns of Software, which is not just about patterns. He actually has a series of essays on software development, and he talks about a number of um, concerns, a number of aspects of software development that are interesting. But what I think is really intriguing is that when we talk about software architecture, what do we mean by the term architecture? We often mean structure. That's a shorthand for structure. We talk about something structural, because that's what we talk about with buildings. We talk about structure. Sometimes we talk about purpose. What kind of building is it? What kind of software is it? But there's another aspect. Architecture defines the quality of what it's like to live somewhere, the quality of what it's like to work somewhere. And that gives us a different word to use, habitability. Habitability is not a word you normally hear. We normally talk about maintainability, readability. This is bigger than all of those. Habitability is the characteristic of source code that enables programmers and people coming to the code later in his life to understand its construction and intentions and to change it comfortably and confidently. That's what you want in your code. Yeah? This is, it makes a place livable, like home. This is what we want. People, developers feel at home and can place their hands on any item without having to think deeply about where it is. This is why we care about software structure, why people have arguments about how to organize their code bases. I don't know, where should we put it? Oh, I have no idea. Put it in util. 
Util ends up, if you like, it's a, there's a sort of a negative algorithm. Anything that ends up in Util didn't fit anywhere else. Where is it? Can you find it there? No, it's in Util's. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the last place you look. Poor structure. But we also get it when people sort of say, yeah, you know, I hacked up some, I hacked up some code. Uh, oh, I was talking to somebody um, this week, and they, um, I was talking about the uh, code base size. Um, what, what did he say? He said, we've got a 50,000 line JavaScript app. Fortunately, he told me that when I was sitting down. Because I'm sitting there going, like, that language does not scale to 50,000 lines of code. Please don't do this to anybody. That must be a nightmare. I'd much rather have 50,000 lines of pretty much anything else, with the possible exception of PHP. <laughs> so the, the point there is that's not habitable. He doesn't feel good about this. He doesn't enjoy working in that place. Why would you enjoy working in a place like that? It is a place. If, you, if you're a programmer, the code base is where you spend most of your day. Yeah, you're in a physical space, but you're also in a mental place. And we want that to be a comfortable place. We need to make that good. So the sizing is, is kind of significant. So I'll refer back to art and writing. Ernest Hemingway made the observation, eschew the monumental, shun the epic. All the guys who can paint great pictures, can, great big pictures, can paint great small ones. Sometimes people take the measure of software as like, oh, the number of people that are developing it and the number of lines of code, and this is how many classes we have. It's like, yeah, it's really big. And I bet you have a big car as well, and you know the other things that go with that. The point is, this is compensating. It turns out that if you're doing your job right, you can really get the right people, the right code. You can get it so that it fits in your head. There is this idea that the challenge of software development is an intellectual one. And therefore, what you're trying to do with code, code is a codification. It's a basically a structured form of knowledge. What you're doing is you're saying, here's how we believe this system will run. Here's what we believe the business is. This is how we believe people will interact with it. These are our beliefs about the technology and how it all binds together. Programming is knowledge management. It is organization. It is codification of what you're thinking. But also, it is fiction because you can think in many different ways, and none of them is necessarily true. Yeah? Software is executable fiction. So this is one of those interesting things. Shun the epic. Monumental stuff is not good. Paint the small pictures. The Facebook iOS app has over 18,000 Objective-C classes. And in a single week, 429 people contributing to it. 18,000 classes. If you told me I had 18,000 lines, I'd probably still think that was too much. I mean, I, I mean, maybe, okay, I use Android. Maybe the iOS users can tell me, oh my god, you're so missing out. There's so much more functionality on iOS. It's like you have your own operating system and you can touch the stars in the universe. But instead of touching the stars in the universe, 18,000 classes. I mean, that has its own gravitational field. <laughs> it's a gravitational field that is so large that whole galaxies are organized around it. Look, 429 developers fell into the black hole. <laughs> if you want to make a big system, one of the simplest ways to do that is to put lots of people on it. I could take everybody in this room, and I bet you we could make the biggest Hello World program ever. <laughs> Hello world, and one person goes, yeah, but you only need one line for that. Pfft, we can enterprise this. <laughs> That's the point, is that what you've done is you fulfilled a prophecy when somebody says, I think it's going to be a big project. What should we do? Let's make it big. Let's put lots of people on it. Let's adopt practices that actually defeat any attempt to keep it small. It's a skill that we have. Anderson's law makes this observation. Paul Anderson science fiction author. I've yet to see any problem, however complicated, which, when you looked at in the right way, did not become still more complicated. Damn, that's programming. That's the point. There's, a, there's an aspect here that we are failing to get at. And it is down sometimes to how we want to think. So uh, Robert McKee wrote this very interesting book, Story. It is about screenwriting. It is about plot. It's about characters. And I, I read this. I'm not a screenwriter. I write very short fiction. 
But it turns out that when you tell a story in one medium, you can learn skills in another. There's some really good insights in this book. But one of the things he says about writing, he says, if a plot works out exactly as you first planned, you're not working loosely enough to give room to your imagination and instincts. It's an act of creativity. There is a problem here that sometimes we narrow down too soon. As I said before, if you're, if you're programming something, you are organizing your thoughts. You are organizing knowledge. But the other thing that I didn't say is that you don't know everything. I know, I'm sorry. Maybe your parents told you you did. But you don't. Oh, no, I do know somebody who knows everything, my son. He's a, he's a teenager. Teenagers know everything. But after that, you suddenly discover, maybe I don't know everything. You are always working with incomplete knowledge. When you get up in the morning, you work with incomplete knowledge about what the day will bring. It turns out humans are actually quite good at working with incomplete knowledge. The problem is when we fool ourselves into thinking that we know everything. And then we make plans that are very, very precise. And we make commitments that are very, very strong. But the very act of programming, because it lives in the detail, that's where you find things. You find really interesting stuff. And it's not always good interesting, but sometimes it is. If that's where some of the creativity is. You don't know how you're going to respond to certain things. You might have a new idea. And we narrow things down too soon. So, as well as taking photographs of books, I'm also quite interested in language. I'm interested in words. I run a, book on fa uh, run a page on Facebook, Word Friday. And every Friday, that would be tomorrow, I've got to figure out tomorrow's word. Every Friday, I post a word, an unusual word and its definition. But the rest of the week, I just post language stuff. But one of the useful words, so I want you to leave this keynote with something useful you can impress your colleagues with. Here's a useful word. I don't know how you're going to get this in into a conversation, but you know, <laughs> if you can get it into conversation, go, yeah, biquinary coded decimal. What's biquinary coded decimal? Biquinary coded decimal, a system of representing numbers based on counting in fives. Well, I don't know where that idea came from. With an additional indicator to show whether the count is in the first or the second half of the decimal range, whether the number represented is in the range 0 to 4 or 5 to 9, or 1 to 5, 6 to 10. It turns out that this exists in a number of places. This system is found in many abacus systems, a proper abacus system, not the, one you give to, not the ones you give to children, which tend to have columns of 10. A proper abacus system has 5, 2, 5, 2, 5, 2. It's a biquinary coded decimal system. You're, in fact, some of the older computers, the late 1940s, the Colossus, at the uh, University of Cambridge had um, uh, was based on biquinary coded decimal. And then everybody gave up after that and said, you know, really, we should just stick to binary. It's a lot easier. But it used to be the case that people tried to fake up decimal systems in computers. One of the classic biquinary coded decimal systems is the Roman numeral system. And you know, the one story has it that one of the things is that it was actually based on the hands. If you're communicating across a marketplace, here's one, it's two, three, that's five. That's a hundred. I can communicate really easily just using my hands. But it's also become a bit of a, a carter, a coding carter in the software craftsmanship community. The idea that how do you take an integer and turn it into a string representation, Roman numerals? And lots of people kind of take on this. So let, first of all, let's start off with the enterprise version. Yeah, hell. I'm being paid. Typing is the bottleneck. Type faster. I'm being paid by the line of code. Magnificent. There you go. You make more money. OK, we've clearly not understood the problem on its deeper terms. So clearly, this is a naive way of doing it. And we can refactor from that into a table-driven approach. This is my favorite approach. OK, so. I like this approach. It's, it's, it's quite elegant. It's simple. It actually has a number of uh, declarative properties. Uh, I really like it. So I would, a lot of people stop there and say, yeah, yeah, Roman numerals, done. But you're not thinking loosely enough. Where's your creativity? A friend of mine came, up, came along to me uh, a couple of years back, and he said, I've come across a new, he showed me a blog. He said, this guy's done it in a completely different way. It's like, what? Looked at it. It's not a number problem. 
it's not a mathematical problem. It's a symbolic problem. Forget binary. Let's do it in unary. What? So here it is in unary. Let me just translate this for you. Take a number, turn it into its unary representation. What's unary? Well, if binary is zeros and ones, unary is ones. So four is I, 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 I. What you do is you create that, and then you put it into a pipeline, and you replace it. You replace five I's with V's. You replace four I's with IV. It's a successive sequence of re I'm not going to claim this is efficient, by the way. But it is, a, it is a profoundly elegant way of doing it. And it actually turns out that although it's not a, the most um, efficient way to solve this problem, on the other hand, is this likely to be a bottleneck? On the other hand, are there many customers who actually want this functionality? Probably not. But it's about thinking. It's about trying to approach problems more creatively. So, I, uh, my, my, so we, we tackled this. My friend, I think the original version was in F-sharp. My friend and I, we uh, rewrote it in Ruby. Um, um, and then I rewrote it in Python because it's more elegant. Um, yeah, start a language war. Uh, and then just for fun, I thought, why don't we do it in Bash? Because you know what? You can. I would never have thought of this. And it turns out that there's a whole concept here that when you've opened it up, you have learned something new and profound that you may actually be able to apply to something else. We confine ourselves to too narrow a view of our own practices and our own thinking. So one of my favorite quotes, and you can apply it almost anywhere in software development in terms of practices, techniques, thinking, solutions, design ideas. Uh, Emile Auguste Chartier, nothing is more dangerous than an idea when you have only one idea. And we normally fix on the first thing. We can also observe that there is nothing more dangerous than an IDE when you have only one IDE. And quite frankly, the way that most people approach object orientation, there is nothing more dangerous than OO when you have only one object. You know what I'm talking about. Singleton. But it turns out, there is a good singleton in this world. It is a whiskey. And when you drink this whiskey, it will solve all of the problems with the singletons in your code. Because you'll sit there and you'll slow down. You'll kind of enjoy the warm fire. And you'll think, you know what? Maybe I won't put that big global variable in the center of the code. Maybe I'll try and think about the problem instead. So that's the good singleton. And that's my one. You get your own. So I managed to find all these bottles in my office that actually made up a, a useful sentence. We have a problem that sometimes, because there is so much to do, there's so much to know, and we cannot know everything, that it's very easy to fall into patterns of behavior and cargo cult programming without realizing that we should be thinking rather than just following our habits and following other people. Cargo cult programming is a style of computer programming characterized by the rich inclusion of code or program structures that serve no real purpose. A lot of people have this. They, they sort of like, right, how are we going to solve this problem? Well, I need this framework, that framework, that framework, and that framework. And then suddenly you realize you didn't. And it's quite embarrassing, because you now have this huge, great footprint. I mean, to download, just on the face, I mentioned Facebook earlier on, to download the Facebook, a Facebook page is actually larger than some operating systems. If you actually, if you actually snoop the wire, you are, the amount of stuff you are downloading, just so you can post pictures of cats and comment on somebody else's picture of their food. I mean, that's a lot of, that's a lot of wasted bandwidth. And why is that there? It's because most of it is ritual inclusion of stuff. It's not been challenged. It's not been reasoned through. And we have our singleton friends and other habits that we have. Cargo cult programming can also refer to the results of applying a design pattern or coding style blindly without understanding the reason behind that design principle. So where I want to take this and where I want to wrap up, as again, this goes back in time, a long way back in time. Um, Robert Floyd, he wrote this book, um, sorry, he wrote this paper, The Paradigms of Programming. Uh, he's the guy that we actually have to blame for introducing the word paradigm to software development. 
Yeah? Before 1979, nobody talked about paradigms. And then he won the Turing Award, and this is the uh, paper associated with um, his uh, acceptance speech. And it's worth reading. If you're going to use the P word, if you're going to use the paradigm word, read this paper, because it's much more interesting than what you think a paradigm is. Importantly, he starts off the word paradigm giving it a definition. It means a pattern. It means an example. That's really interesting. It's an archetype. And this is interesting because the way, when you start reading this, you suddenly realize that his perspective is not what you might have thought. What we exist, uh, what we're having at the moment, and what we've had for many years, in one form or another, is paradigm wars. People say, oh, this paradigm is better than that paradigm. That's not what his perspective is at all. He's actually offering and asking for something else. And this is as true now as it, is in 19, as it was in 1979. I believe the current state of the art of computer programming reflects inadequacies in our stock of paradigms. In other words, he's not saying we have not found the one true paradigm. He says we need more. We need more ways of thinking. A paradigm is a way of thinking. And we don't want less thinking. We want more of it. In our knowledge of existing paradigms, in the way we teach programming paradigms, in the way our programming languages support or fail to support the paradigms of their user communities, their user communities being, in this case, the programmers. Back to PX, programmer experience. So I'll leave you with this thought. It comes from uh, John Romero, who's one of the uh, original founders of uh, uh, ID, the ID studio. Uh, and gave us uh, such uh, games as Doom and Wolfenstein and all this kind of stuff. I want to bring back the logic, but he makes a point here. Unifying everything. Programming is a creative art form based in logic. It is creative. There is an artistic element. But we understand that that artistic element is grounded in logic, and it's subordinate to the fact that somebody wants something from it that is utilitarian. But that doesn't stop it being creative or art, and which means you need to think more, not less. Thank you very much. Do you want to say? Okay, so um, has anybody got any questions or thoughts? Don't be shy. Don't yeah. be shy. Really, it is, you're, not, you're not nursing a hangover. I, well, maybe you are. Maybe you could tell us about that. Where were you last night that I missed out on? Uh, congratulations. This is a really good talk. Thank, Thank you very so much. much. Uh, are you talking about the craftsman and the craftsman part of the of the software? Uh, but in in functional programming uh, communities, they are talking that uh, using functional programming and using function high order and using a theory category and algebra, we can define the development as a science. We can give a formal idea of the of the program like a science, and we can define on a category theory about the code. Do you think that this is possible? What is your opinion about this one? Do you think we can define, uh, we can define in a future the software as a science or not right now? Uh, there's multiple answers to this, which is a fancy way of saying it depends. Oh, actually, no, it's an elaborate way of saying no, but I'm not just going to say no. First thing is, that premise is really good if you want funding. This is a great way to get funding. It's a great way to do a PhD. Start with that, because you will be in a job for life. This research will never end. So that's my first observation. It turns out that if we do eventually automate the creation and formalize the creation of software, it will not be through mathematics. It will not be through an algebra. If anything, it will be through deep learning, which is a great mystery. In other words, hey, look, this thing's churning out great software. Does anybody know how? I have no idea. So in other words, I think it's really sweet that people still believe you can formalize stuff like that. That's really good. It doesn't work. Oh, it works in certain cases. And that's the thing that's interesting. It turns out that there are some things that we can rigorously define. And we can do this. And we're better at doing it now. So I think there is something to that, but it won't apply to all of software development because software development ultimately involves people. And I don't just mean doing the software development, I mean people that want things from software. Because you're asking a harder question. What do you want? When people talk about requirements, they use a very 
neutral and cold language, as if we have our requirements in our heads. What are your requirements? Well, I'm glad you asked me that, because in my head, I have an Evernote file that is perfectly structured, ordered list of requirements. No, that's not how human beings think. We are much messier than that. So the problem is that whilst we may formalize some aspects, so for example, something like security, that can be formalized, and there's some really interesting work in that space. That can be ground down. But what we want from a system, that until you can formalize the human brain, you will not be able to do that. There's a separate question as well, which is, is functional programming neat and cool and fun, and does it help us to reason about code? Absolutely. What I gave you there when I showed you that Roman numeral solution was a functional program. That piece of bash was functional code. It has no side effects. It's based, um, it is a, it's a pure pipeline, and it is an example of concatenative programming, which is a sub-paradigm of functional programming. It is far easier to reason about than the imperative version. So, multiple answers, some of which are saying, yeah, functional programming is great. Um, mathematical discipline can be really helpful. Um, we will be able to formalize certain subdomains, but no, we will not be able to do the whole thing. But yes, if you want to say you can do the whole thing, there's an infinite research grant waiting for you. Thank you. Somewhere there is a okay. microphone. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I really like the thinking about the different paradigms, and the paradigms, and in fact, uh, lots of people are thinking that it should be one paradigm because it's a way of thinking, and I totally agree that it shouldn't be one because, like, um, functional programming is good for behaviors but not good for describing the stuff, uh, objective, and so they are um, they should cooperate together. Uh, but the problem is like I know the four paradigms. It's like uh, functional, objective, uh, reactive. Uh, oh fuck! <laughs> but I, I, I you I actually I was going to say you know more than you think you do. But please continue. But, but the point is they are all like really old. Ah, and logic. The comics that you s yeah. uh, showed in the beginning was about the logic programming. In fact, yes. Uh, but. Uh, they are all really old, and what the hell happened with that? I think uh, after this article, no more like popular paradigms um, were created, or I don't know them. What is happening, or maybe I'm wrong, maybe there are m much more of uh, paradigms? Right, that's an interesting question. So actually, in those spaces, there are actually multiple paradigms. Uh, paradigms are not normalized. In other words, there's no clear boundary between paradigms. You know, you don't, you, there's no border control between paradigms. You know, you are now leaving functional programming and entering logic programming. It turns out that half the things that people say are really cool about modern functional programming languages came from logic programming languages. Um, to, so, for example, uh, unification, pattern matching, all of this kind of stuff. That's a, that, that did not come from functional originally, that came from logic. Um, so it turns out that they're, they're, they're much closer to each other in some ways. And they also have subdivisions. So people say they know the object paradigm, but do they? I mean, if you work in a dynamic language, if you work in Python, your object model is completely different to the object model in JavaScript. It's actually a completely different way of thinking. If I work in Java, it's completely different again. In other words, each of these actually has a completely different mental model. It's not just a different language. It's actually a fundamentally different approach to what uh, is objects. And then there's enterprise objects. Enterprise objects. Hell, let's just have really big manager and controller classes. Yeah, That's a paradigm. It's not a very good one. But there's a lot of people thinking in it. Um, and so, and as I said, with functional, you've got concatenative as a subdomain or a, a paradigm in its own right. Um, it feels really different to an applicative approach. So these are all, there's actually a, a wealth of these. And the question is, is there anything new under the sun? Um, I'm going to say probably not, or at least not in this space. As you observe, this stuff's kind of old, and what happens is a shift in balance. When we look at reactive programming, for example, reactive programming, I, I did a, I did a, a one-day seminar yesterday where I was looking at mixing paradigms, and one of my conclusions was reactive programming is actually synthesized out of four or five key patterns that are already known and existed, but they are combined to create something particular and focused. And we now understand that. So the difference, perhaps, is not that there are no we're not finding lots of new paradigms, is that we are understanding the better. 
That's, that is a difference. If we go back to 1979, we actually didn't understand or have names for half of the things. But now we do. But I think we've also started to exhaust the space in which we are in. These are old ideas. If you want a new paradigm of programming, you actually have to step outside completely. I mentioned deep learning a moment ago. Let's talk about quantum computing. Or maybe not. Or yes, or no, or both at the same time. So the point there is the paradigms that we're looking at, these, these are not the paradigms. In the space that we're in, it's kind of like we're all looking around the same kind of ideas, and we're kind of getting better at seeing that space. And I think we may have run out. I think we'll just get new names for older ideas, and we'll understand them better. But I think until we actually do something fundamental, we may be stuck in this space. And it's a good space to be in. There's still a lot of stuff. But I do find that in a lot of my slides, I refer to really old stuff. You know, I, I, yeah, I think 1979 was the earliest I showed today. Yesterday, the earliest I showed was 1961. And the, uh, and the point there is it turns out that we kind of know this stuff, we just don't know that we know it sometimes. So I think that we are filling out a particular space and getting really good at it, but actually the big sh there, there are big shifts elsewhere. And we actually genuinely have to go somewhere different. I don't think the traditional approach is going to be um, that much newer or better for that much longer. And I'm doomed when I say that, because this is now on video and I'm making a prediction. And the last time I made a prediction, it was pretty much totally wrong. So, you know, I, uh, uh, you can ignore everything I say on this point. Okay, uh, do we have, uh, we have time for another question? One more question. Do we have one more question? Or was you gonna force Don't be it? shy, people. Don't be shy. Okay, wait a minute, wait, wait for the microphone to get, get to you. Okay, uh, so you already told uh, that your last prediction was very wrong, but I will ask you for our next one. You already said that uh, you do not believe that in near future programmers will be replaced by some super clever machines, but uh, can you share your idea how the programmer's job will look like in maybe 30, 50 years? 30, 50 years? Okay, hang on. How or maybe maybe gonna... less, let's say 10. Yeah, I'm just trying to work out if I'm going to be alive or not to regret it. Um, <laughs> No, I did actually make, I'll tell you what, I made some predictions in 2005 that are actually on video, and I was right uh, for 2015, and I was actually right about some of those. But I found an article that I wrote in 1998, and I was wrong on half of what I said. Um, uh, but now you're asking me for the safe zone of 30 to 50 years. You know what, I, you could, in about 30 to 50 years, I'll either be dead or I just will have no idea what you're talking to me about, so I'm cool. I can say absolutely anything that I want. Um, Okay, so how, how do we think? So what are the current trends? So we're always constrained. We're always constrained by what we by by what we believe, and we we although we are imaginative, we still run along the same tracks. But let me let, so so there's a danger here. But let me try a different approach. Um, William Gibson, science fiction author William Gibson, is often attributed with saying the future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. Okay, in other words, there are people doing things, and this is the observation about the past. We knew a lot of stuff in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and so on, but we just didn't know we knew it. We didn't know collectively. We weren't all doing it, just some people here and some people there. And what we've got is more and more people and, uh, uh, knowing this. So what is it that people are doing now that is kind of interesting? Well, I think one of the things that I, I, I think we're going to see a shift in, uh, and we're beginning to see this, is when we codify things, when we actually write code, we make mistakes because sometimes people put that down to the syntax of a language or the trickiness of a library, and sometimes that is true. But sometimes because the challenge is because we are trying to be precise about ideas that we only vaguely grasp, and we make mistakes as a result. So when I first got into professional software development, expert systems were the things that people were talking about. Okay, this is way before deep learning became a thing. Um, and yeah, at that point, at, at best, in fact, it was still only emerging. We had shallow learning. Um, uh, but expert systems were the things that people were talking about. And I remember thinking, wouldn't it be really cool if I had an expert system to help me debug? Wouldn't it be really cool if I had an expert system to help me with understanding the system? Because it can probably see some things that I don't. These days, we have huge, great dashboards of noise. And Sometimes error messages get better, sometimes they get worse. 
often they get worse. They become more complicated in some cases. But we're seeing with, uh, I saw a great demo of uh, Elm um, the other day. That's a, that's a compiler system that that's a compiler system that gives you really interesting error messages. It sort of says, you meant this, but did you mean this? And it's not just like you missed out a semicolon. It's actually much deeper. That's a direction I think we're heading in. In other words, that's just using good old classic computer science, Levenstein distances and things like that, of what did you likely mean. But if we combine deep learning into that, the idea of actually having um, intelli you know, we talk about is intellisense, actually having something that is intelligent, assist us, and actually understand the code, not merely give us static analysis and dynamic analysis, but actually suggestions and observations, um, genuine feedback, uh, and not like these cheap bots that you get in Slack. I mean, really something much deeper. So in other words, um, I think that's one of the directions that we're going to head in. I genuinely think that uh, there's a lot of other stuff that can then also be start ge being generated. I think that people will often sort of say, I'm going to generate and then evaluate it. And the human is the reviewer. And there will be approximately, I'm going to suggest this, and you're going to come back with that, and I'm going to say that's OK, and then we're going to generate from that. So it, the development will continue to be a dialogue, but now not merely between people, but between something that can know stuff that we, will not si uh, we cannot know, but is grounded in formalism. So the human element will remain, but I think that the balance will shift. Um, understanding legacy code, that's a really interesting challenge. Really interesting challenge. That is, if somebody wants, if you want lots of funding, that's where to go. So that's where I think that we'll, uh, we'll also see a lot of interesting stuff from deep learning. Sometimes people try to do formal conversions of old code into new code. I know people who've you know, formally translated um, uh, legacy object Pascal into uh, .NET and C Sharp stuff by creating effectively uh, a sort of intelligent transpiler system. But it's, it, it's still not proper intelligence, that one. They're still looking at a direct mapping. I think in a legacy system, there is deeper knowledge that you need to learn about the system and understanding it. So architecture, maintenance, I think that's where we're heading. I think there is the possibility, this is the bit where you can tell me when I'm wrong in 30 years' time, I think there is the possibility we, will, we can get rid of legacy code because we can have systems that eliminate the legacy. They, keep it, they are able to help us keep it current in a cost-effective way. Okay, there you go. I've said it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so put it in the calendar. Contact me 30 years' time. I'll still be called Kevin Henney. And, you know, you can check back on me. I'm going to say that was, there was a close one, but I'm going to say that was the best question. Okay. For which you get, you get a thing. You get a thing. Yeah. There you go. It's a, a box. Surprise. I mean, I mean what, how good are we to you? Yeah, a exactly. box of stuff. So, you know, box. think outside it. Yeah. Smart home box. So. Okay. so give the man applause. Well, Okay, thank you very much. I think we're done. Yep. And give our speaker a warm applause as well.